Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalia Chernetska, and I am from Paris um, Women DS chapter. Just will try to share my screen, which is always um, an adventure. Okay. All right. It's already in the beginning. Slide show. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. As the, it's a, it's a joint meetup um, of two women this chapters, women in machine learning and data science. Uh, we are extremely happy to do it together with um, with our friends from from Limassol. And so, um, first, before uh, we start um, we start um, the meetup proper, some uh, words of. Um, online conduct. So if you don't speak, please switch off the video to say bandwidth, mute your microphone also when you're not speaking. But when the moderator, uh, moi, I uh, ask you to speak, please uh, unmute yourself. If you want to ask questions, you can raise your hand or you can use chat. And if by any chance we get disconnected, we all have a link and we can calmly reconnect. Okay. So um, for, for those of you who do not know, Women in Machine Learning and Data Science is a worldwide organization uh, whose purpose is to support um, women working um, in machine learning and data science, women or, or gender minorities, or interested in, in those topics. There are over 50,000 members worldwide, over 90 chapters, and over 30 countries represented. And um, the uh, events of women in machine learning, uh, data science have also a con code of conduct based on the principles of dignity at work, basically being polite to our speakers, don't interrupt in them. And if we uh, provide feedback, the feedback is constructive. Okay, so, so this is a few words of introduction. So um, we, um, what is the proceedings of today? We are starting with this introduction of Paris chapter, just very few words about us. Then um, we're going to have a presentation from this Lima Sol, and then two uh, fantastic talks, one uh, by um, uh, Xenia Miskuridou uh, from Cyprus, but also from Imperial College London, and then another talk by um, Soteria Bampadzani from Athens, but also from Paris. And so we are extremely happy that this meetup is, is really, really international. Um, so if you want to tweet uh, about the event, you are free. You can use hashtags and the handles of both Limassol and Paris chapters. Okay, now just a few, few words about the Paris chapter. So, Paris chapter was founded in, um, in 2017, and it's now the third largest chapter in the world, after New York and Bay, um, Bay Area in the US. And we have more than 4,000 members of Meetup, um, more than 2,000 followers on Twitter, and more than 1,500 followers on LinkedIn. And the organizers today is a team of four people, plus we rely also on volunteers. So um, Chloe Agatazenkot and um, uh, Caroline Sharia, two co-founders, and we, myself and Marie, we joined later. Now, just very few lessons I would like to share. Perhaps it could be useful for you who are in general organizing events or interested in speaking at the event. First of all, one of the things, as I said, we are the largest chapter, and one of the things we, we always try to do is to provide quality content. We did it in um, uh, on-site, uh, during the on-site meetup, when we had always a technical talk and a third talk about topics about women, society, economics, um, business. And when uh, all the events moved uh, online, we decided to build bridges and started doing events with, with other chapters in, in Europe. Another lesson is to communicate. You know, we communicate before the event, after the event, about the speakers. We also publish summaries on, on Medium. We obviously support our community. I mean, we share, share job offers. We retweet uh, their um, messages. We um, 
give information about conferences, we share uh, papers written by women, we also organize paper reading sessions. So um, this is interesting. So quite often when you have a new chapter or new organization, it's difficult to find speakers. And we found a very good solution, something we call first time speakers. In other words, people who have spoken at work or um, in their lab, in their institution, but people who are, have never spoken to wider audience. 50% of our speakers are first time speakers. We are very happy about it. And um, uh, quite often we have seen that after a woman speaks at our meetup, she's then detected. She was under, under the radar, now she's detected and she's invited uh, over and over to speak at also larger conferences. And what is interesting, quite often her bosses also note that she becomes quite uh, more visible and so she gets a promotion. Something interesting, if you partner with someone, do win-win. Even if you're a small organization, they're big, do some things that only make sense for you. Like for example, if you partner with Big Meetup, you provide a speaker, they provide a speaker. Or if they want to do some promotion, you should get some benefit out of it. Uh, so we have, there are four of us, and so we divide the work. So it's, it's quite a lot of work for, for one person, but for four, it's completely feasible. And finally, we share opportunities with our, with our community. For example, when we are invited to speak and the topic is not of interest to the team, or we cannot make it, we always pass this opportunity to the speakers. So this is a Paris chapter, and I will... Um, stop sharing my screen now. And now we'll have um, uh, Georgina speaking about the Limassol chapter. Um, yeah, hi from me. This is actually Christina. Um, Georgina is in the waiting room actually right now. Uh, but uh, I can give the introduction for the Limassol chapter. So um, I would like to welcome you also to this meeting on behalf of the Women in Machine Learning chapter in, in Limassol. Um, we are attached to Limassol because uh, the rules of the global organization are, um, are that you have to attach yourself to a specific city, but we feel that since Cyprus is quite a small country, we are uh, representing Cyprus as a whole. And um, we are a relatively new chapter. We were formed about a year ago. So this is actually our second event uh, since we were established. It was established by myself and uh, Georgina Trifu. Uh, and we are the two co-organizers that uh, run this group. Um, we were not able to do as much as we hoped to do this year because of the extraordinary circumstances. But um, our aim is um, to bring uh, women and minorities together, share not only technical, but also general professional experience um, when working as a data scientist in Cyprus or anywhere else uh, in the world. Uh, the field is, is rapidly evolving in Cyprus and uh, we are very excited to see more and more women and gender minorities joining in. And um, that's why we believe that it's important to have uh, this chapter to exchange knowledge and uh, to support each other and to support our colleagues within uh, the ecosystem. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Paris chapter for reaching out to us and uh, giving us this opportunity to exchange knowledge and get to know each other and also thank uh, very much the speakers and um, Xenia, who is an upcoming uh, star in Cyprus in the area of machine learning and, and data science, and who was um, very excited from the beginning about this uh, opportunity. And uh, not wanting to take more of your time, uh, thank you again, and I hope to see you all again in, in future events. Thank you very much, Christina, and we hope at some point to come to a live event in Cyprus. I think this would be yes. wonderful. Yes, you are very welcome to come. Yes.
<laughs> so thanks a lot. And now, um, without further ado, I will um, give the floor to Xenia Miskuridu, who is from Cyprus, but works for Imperial College London, and she's going to um, present her talk. Okay, so Xenia, you can, you can share your screen, you can unmute yourself, I guess. Yes. Um... Oh. Yes, we can okay. see. That's fine. And I'm just gonna full screen. Yeah, perfect. Oh. So can, can, yeah, you, perfect. can you all see well? Perfect. Okay, that's great. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for uh, firstly, you know, for the opportunity for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I think it's a great initiative to have, you know, a joint event with Paris, and I hope we can do it in the future. And it's exciting for me to be here and. I'll present to you some of the work I've done during my PhD back in Oxford, uh, whereas, you know, right now I'm, I'm, I'm a research associate at Imperial College London. Quite recently, I defended my PhD. Uh, so that's work I've done during that. Um, and just to, you know, give you a little bit of overview of me before I start, uh, the area I worked in during my PhD is the so-called statistical machine learning. And um, it's, um, I, it was, I would say a very broad and kind of rich experience um, that I had during the PhD because I had the chance to explore different areas. And I'll try to reflect this in, in, in this talk. And these are because of different opportunities and experiences I had throughout uh, by visiting places like, um, like the computer science department um, at NYU. Um, and some months I spent at, at Google in Zurich and, uh, and also a great time I had at the Alan Turing Institute in London. So my goals for, for this talk are the following. Uh, the first one to give a little bit of an overview of a few areas I've seen um, during my research and uh, to like, compare them and, and contrast them somehow. They are big areas in machine learning. And the second goal is to further elaborate on one of them, mainly the, the so-called probabilistic modeling and how I used it. And the third one is to take a step back and reflect on some potential strengths and limitations that these two areas have and how we could address them. So um, my research map is the following. Everything I have done and uh, I've worked so far in machine learning falls under the umbrella of statistical machine learning. And we, we called it that way, this is how we, call, we called ourselves aiming to, to communicate that we want to have algorithms that are you know, efficient, fast, they can answer some scientific question of interest, but they also have all the nice properties of statistics, which are uh, being, being, being as accurate as possible. And of course, trying to explain the system because that's what statistics is about. So this is not trivial, it's a big challenge. And this connects to the two areas I would like to briefly introduce, uh, which are probabilistic modeling and deep learning. So when it comes to probabilistic modeling, something I worked a lot on, the goal is to model, model an event and a phenomenon using uh, random variables and probability distributions. And a big, like, a big part of it is to, to express the dynamics, right? There is a complex system there and we really care about explaining the structure, explaining the, the underlying data generating mechanism. And what statistics gives us quite often is uh, accurate methods. We can have guarantees, things like, you know, that, you know, this, this algorithm will converge to the truth, you know, under some assumptions. On the other hand side, we have deep learning. So deep learning, a bit more modern, you know, modern field of ML, um, definitely drives the field, I would say, but it has some fundamental differences. So deep learning, uh, the, the whole point is to design algorithms uh, whose structure is inspired by the structure of neural networks in the brain. That's why the main tool here is artificial neural networks. And they, they mainly rely on computation. So you can process thousands of data and a lot of computations very fast. And you know, that's very important. But the goal is not to understand the system. You don't really capture the, you know, the underlying things, you can express what's really happening in, in, the com in a complex system you want to model. But the point is prediction. So in statistics, we explain the model in deep learning and computation, we care about prediction. So the goals of these two areas are different, but what I really believe in is that combining their strengths are, is, is promising. And that's something that 
I, I really try to do throughout, you know, my PhD and, you know, my research now. And um, I'll, I'll come back to this um, later on. So I'll, I'll start by explaining um, some work I've done that falls under the first area, so the probabilistic modeling part. And, and essentially how I use probabilistic modeling tools in order to explain and understand and model social interactions. So I'll, I'll start by pre presenting the, the setup here. So when I say social interactions, I mean, uh, it can be any kind of interaction data that, can, that doesn't have to be social, but it's data that comes in the form of triplets. So you have I, J, T, which means that there was an action from somebody, a node A, towards J at some time T. So targeted, directed actions at some time point. These types of things appear in social uh, scenarios, like very, you know, obvious examples are emails and messages being sent between people in time, or when you have online blogs, when somebody posts something and then you, you know, you respond and, and then they got response and there's the sequence of events. Um, in biology, we find them. Um, I've encountered very nice applications in, in protein interactions. So proteins actually interact uh, and we have time-stamped events in, in neural, neural activity, having neurons firing against uh, each other and, and you, you get the same kind of thing. And regardless of the context, the, the questions we have, the, the goals we have are, are similar. So we always want to understand what are the factors that underpin these interactions and to uncover a trend. So you want to understand like how often do this occur or what, what really you know, drive this interaction? Is there you know, an, an underlying factor or some causal factor or something? Um, and at the same time, you know, this I and J, whether they are people or, or you know, proteins or, or, or blogs online, they are they, they, they belong to, to a network. So apart from understanding the, the relationship between you know, these two people and the sequence of events, you want to understand the underlying graph. So there's a big graph, we're all, we're all part of a network. How does it look like? How does it evolve? How does it grow? Is it, does it have some sort of structure? Um, and of course, um, now if I put my you know, more computational hat on, uh, apart from understanding what's happening, I also want to predict future links. Um, very important. Like you, you want to learn the structure using some part of the data you have and then predict what's going to happen. How many links will come? How many messages do I expect? And I can use it to answer a question that I'm interested in uh, regarding um, you know, the context that I am in, whether it's uh, social, like transportation, biology or anything. So here I'll just show you a show a toy example, um, just to make sure that we understand the context. So this is a subset of some data work that that are, are data uh, of an internal uh, social network of a college in California and their students messaging against each other. It's like a private Facebook Facebook type of thing. So um, B, um, it's a boy here who sends a message to A at this relative time 2.1. So these are just hours. So this is, you know, the second hour, uh, like a normalized time. So the second hour and, and, some, and, and kind of six minutes. So B sends this message at time point A and then sends another one and then A responds finally. And then B sends another one, A responds again and A responds again. And then B sends this other uh, message at this time 8.1 and then another one. So simple. Uh, that you know, we had these two people, and over this uh, this period of ten uh, time units, we had these interactions with this direction and this time. So it may have not been super obvious in this example that like the key property that I'm interested in and I want to model um, is what we call reciprocity, which is. Um, when an action from somebody to somebody else, here A and B, increases the ch chances of a similar action being returned in the near future. So in other words, you know, by sending you a message, I encourage you to, to reply back. So I, I like using this example of emails and messages because it's very, like, it's very obvious what's happening, but there are scenarios that it's not super obvious that this reciprocation exists. 
So now in, in probabilistic modeling with, it, with its whole you know, toolbox of, of stats and ML tools, um, how do we model it? So how do you encode in you know, equations and, and, and methods uh, reciprocation? And the tool I use is called point processes. Point processes are, I would say, very technical and you know, a little bit exotic things in, in statistics. Um, but you, you should think of them like uh, sequences of events. So when you model something by a point process is when there is a sequence of events and we want to understand what drives this sequence of events. And the best way to understand it here is by two ingredients, um, N and, and lambda. So by capital N here, I just denote the number of events that has occurred up to some time t. So in this point process, capital N of five would be just the number of points that have appeared in my process up to time five, whether, it, whether it's days or, or you know, minutes or seconds or years. And okay, I, I mean, N is easy. It's just you know, the number of events that, has happened, that have happened. But the whole point is why you know, have they happened and, and what drives them? And what drives them, who defines, who decides how many have happened is lambda. So lambda is the intensity function, which explains the instantaneous probability of another event happening at that time. And like mathematically, how we, we write that is that this n is a realization of the process. And the second equation here just uh, shows that the probability of another event occurring in a small time dt is proportional to lambda. Now, lambda is the thing that you know we'll, I, I'll be focusing on from now on. But something I want you to have in mind is that everything is conditioned on the history. So this bit here is just saying that um, the probability of another message is not like independent of the past. Future is not independent of the past. Wh whether whether I am gonna message you now or tomorrow has to do with you know if you have messaged me uh, in the past. So everything depends on the history. So that was the case for just two people, you know, A and B. Uh, sorry, so that was the case for just a single process. But what I'm interested in is two people, A and B. So this point process, this sequence of events, I need to associate it twice, but independently. So you have A and B. So I have um, capital N of AB counting the events from A to B. And then I have N of BA that counts the events from B to A. And their corresponding intensities are, are here. So I have two processes. And what I want to encode is a reciprocation. So in this language of point processes here, I want to encode that my processors um, are mutually exciting, which means that events from one encourage events on the other. So events from A to B encourage events from B to A. So this excitation needs to be encoded into the main um, quantity that drives the process. And this, this is the intensity. So this here, they, they, they seem a little bit um, you know, we, weird and, and ugly maybe, but this lambda AB, so it's the intensity uh, of the events from A to B. So it's the probability of another event occurring from A to B at time T. And this is a function over the opposite process. So of B to A, and it's a function over the whole time from zero to T. So this is just saying that again, that another, uh, a message being sent from A to B depends on whether the other, like the other guy B has messaged A in the past. And now a natural question here is, okay, then is it the same thing if, if you emailed me yesterday or, or 10 days ago? No, it's not the same thing. And that's why this function G exists here to control that. So G, uh, it, it's small in, in uh, like when the time is near zero. So like in the beginning of our time age, but it would be, it would be very high, very close to T. So saying that in a, in a recent message, you know, I'm message that you sent ages ago and I haven't yet responded, then I'm not going to respond. And this second equation is just uh, symmetrically uh, the same as above. So the probability of another event happening from A to B depends 
on on whether B has sent away um, events in the in the recent past. So if I go back to this example, I think the best way to explain things is graphically, and I have simulated this example here and shown the graphs just to you know make sure we understand the setup. And you should be looking at this diagonal. So on the top left, I have the counting process from A to B. This is simply a step function that goes up by one every time that a message uh, is sent from A to B. So you see that the first message is at time 5.6. And this is just goes up right by one because there's been one message. Now, the interesting thing is what's the impact? When A message B, what's the impact on the intensity of the of the other person. So when A messages B, and this goes up by one, then the intensity of the opposite process here has a spike. This is saying that instantaneously, the probability of response, right, the probability of B responding to A is high, and then it decreases with time. And then, you know, at some other point in time, again, here, there's another message, and what's the impact? The impact is that the opposite process, like the other guy, B, is highly likely to respond. So this is the probability of response that goes up and then decreases with time and so on and so forth. Um, so this was just you know, an example between A and B, but these A and B are people in a network. So I don't want to focus on those only, but I want to, to model every single pair of people in my network. Again, this is like a, a trivial like toy example with, with five people that, you know, but in reality, in like Facebook type of networks or other, other networks you're interested in, there are kind of millions of nodes. So for every pair now, we want to do the same thing. This is the same slide as before, but I, I've replaced A and B with I and J. So that just to show that, you know, for every pair I and J, I would have N, I, J for the events from I towards J, and then an ji for the events from j to i. And again, these processes are mutually exciting by uh, the definition of their intensities. So these are the same as before, but what I have changed is this function here before it was just any function g, but here I've chosen to make it exponential to reflect uh, the graph I showed above. So what this is saying, this is saying that, uh, once uh, I emails J, then the probability that J responds decays exponentially. So this parameter delta here, if it's really big, then it says that you know if you don't reply now or you know tomorrow, you're never going to reply. This, this goes down very fast. And this other parameter eta here just uh, controls how how strong is the impact uh, of of you to me. So instantaneously, how big, how high is that probability of response? If I just go back a, a bit here, so you see that this is an exponential decay, right? And eta, the other parameter, controls this height, okay? Instantaneously, how likely are you to respond? And then the other one controls how fast this decays. Um, and of course, I'm just going to show, uh, say that this eta, this exponential function here is, is a choice because this is what I've observed uh, working with social uh, data sets that um, this is usually the case. Like there's so like so fast, the communication is so fast that people, you know, if they don't reply, they never reply. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that you can make this as personalizable as, as you want. So you can say that the probability of that I respond to a message is not uniform, right? It, it depends to, to, to whom the message is coming from, right? If it's, if it's a friend or a colleague or you know, my sister. Um, but, uh, and the other thing that you can change here is that you can say this changes. So it's different if you email me you know, nine in the morning or, or kind of midnight. So these things are very, uh, are very adjustable. So you can play around and just uh, make this as uniform or personalized as the data set needs it. And I've talked a lot about this part, about this mutual excitation, but I haven't talked at all about this part. So this part here connects to the fact that everybody, I, J, and A, B, and everybody are part of a network. And an assumption here is that in order for me to start messaging, you know, messaging you in this platform, uh, we are 
we are connected, we need to be friends originally, right? We will need to be connected as friends in this platform. So that's new IJ and new JI that are the same thing um, uh, is the probability of connection of I and J. Like is the probability that I send your friend requests. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but like for people who are familiar or interested in, in graph theory and network science, uh, this new IJ is the link probability. So it's the main ingredient that controls the growth of the overall graph, the, like the underlying graph. Uh, this was another big chapter for me in, in, my, in my PhD. Uh, how do you parameterize the link probability in a network in order to, to capture properties that you want? And the properties that I wanted to capture are the properties that I would observe in these social networks. And I would say the most interesting thing is that in social networks, um, this is not the case. So like this first graph here, meaning that um, not everybody has the same connections on average, for instance, but the extremes happen. So like in all the scenarios I, I, I've looked at, you have these very sparse graphs with uh, a lot of people having, you know, just very few connections, like one or two, but then you also get these halves, these like massive, massive nodes over there that have a lot of a lot of connections so the extremes like heterogeneity not homogeneity that would be mostly the case and the other thing that you know this new ij connects to is whether this graph has some structure so groups so people are are organized in groups and you know it's like my school and club and family so so the whether you know we will be sending messages between us depends on these groups of course, you know, people within the same kind of school class would message more. But I'm not going to go in more detail in this because, you know, completely, you know, not opening a different, different topic here. But the point is that new AJ connects to the global graph structure. So, um, yeah, basically, that, that I, would, I wanted to emphasize a lot on how, you know, how this choice of point processes can explain the event. So can explain this reciprocation property that I'm interested in, but how I used it in, in my research is to uh, use some data to learn the structure, learn this, um, this parameter, estimate the parameters using uh, Bayesian inference and particularly uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And then after I have learned these parameters, I would, I would, I would predict, I would use them in, in out of sample data to predict the number of future links. So in my, in my Facebook data set, I would predict how many messages would these people exchange in the next kind of 10 days. So you can use this to measure some sort of interventions that you're interested in. Things like assuming that this part of the network doesn't exist, how does the, uh, the growth change? Or um, you can say it seems that you know removing this community in the network or this link, actually the growth remains the same. So by being able to predict the evolution and the growth and you know the number of links, you can measure and um, obviously you know effects of interventions and you can answer the scientific question of interest that you want. Um, it allows for personalization, as I said. I mean that you can tune these parameters to be you know, different per individual or, you know, the same if you see that there is a uniform behavior. And something I really care about is this number four here that um, this model um, has a very good trade-off in explainability and scalability. Well, that's something of my kind of personal objectives and vision in, you know, in general on building methods that, you know, they're, they're explainable. You can really dissect the mechanics and understand how they work, and also they properly model uh, and explain the phenomenon I'm interested in. But they're also scalable because if it's not fast and efficient, it's not useful. So spending time to make a, you know, make sure that the the algorithm that would give me the final prediction is fast and is scalable, it's super important. And um, so, yeah, this is the literature for that paper. But uh, before, because I think we don't have very, very much time, uh, I wanted to, yeah, to finish with. Um, so, as, as I said before, that you know, I care about explainability and uh, and scalability. 
And this is something that I found a lot using, you know, probabilistic modeling, you know, rich, explainable, and then deep learning, but fast, not so explainable. I think it's, you know, that the gap is not so much between these two, but it's a step before, it's between statistics and computation. So there is a gap between these two areas, but I, as I have mentioned in the beginning, I, I really believe that combining the strengths of these two will contribute to, you know, truly effective and, and reach AI methods and, and algorithms. So um, one way to do that is, you know, whenever working with statistical methods, um, you know, in my research, I would just try to scale them up, right? Make them more efficient, uh, make the complexity of the algorithm, algorithm, you know, not to be kind of, you know, let's say quadratic in the number of, of people in the network, but linear. On the other hand side, you know, in my deep learning project with the artificial neural networks being the main tool, uh, my goal wasn't to, you know, kind of beat the state of the art in, in prediction of something, but my goal is, okay, we have deep learning, it's super fast, but can we make it more probabilistically principled? So can we understand a bit better, you know, also what's happening there? Like, I don't think that we know as community why neural networks work and, and how. Uh, so kind of blending these two, combining the strengths, uh, really I think is promising and it's the way kind of to broader and more creative um, AI and, and machine learning. Um, and I think this brings me to the end. And if, I mean, I don't know, if we have more time, I uh, would love to, to elaborate more on different avenues of, uh, of you know, promising and challenging avenues of AI in the future. But I guess we, we can do that also in the Q&A session. And okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Xenia, for this for this such a pedagogical explanation. And <laughs> yes, uh, we we should uh, we should open the Q and A session, and uh, uh, you can probably elaborate on on the on the future. Yeah, of course. So whoever wants to uh, 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 ask a question, please unmute yourself and ask. Um, yeah, I think Constantina raised the hand. Okay, please go ahead. We can hear you. I don't know who's talking, but we can hear you. Right, so well, can you hear me now because I couldn't unmute. Sorry, somebody had to do this for me. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, very interesting. Um, I am a, uh, I, I am not an expert, so excuse me if I'm, I'm asking naive questions. Um, you said you're applying statistical mechanics methods. Um, my understanding this is an n body uh, interaction system. So how can you make this linear? Um, so you mean how, how can make the complexity linear? Yes, because uh, at that, that, that point, actually, it's not it's not. I mean, I mean, it's a difficult problem. It's statistical mechanics, and I'm yeah. not aware that sure. you can make it linear. So I think that uh, probably yeah, you're talking about something very specific. And when, what, what I'm talking here about is a model I have on a graph. So I'm Bayesian, so I have a prior on my graph with these n people. And when it comes to me to learn the link probability, the algorithm is linear per, per node and per edge. Uh, is not, it, this is not the standard framework of statistical mechanics, which uh, I understand that you're talking about, but it's, it's more about a Bayesian non-parametric model I have on a network of n people. Okay, so you're talking about lean probability. This is a one-to-one. A, a -one. This I, I can imagine you can make linear, but this yes. is not the general n body system. Which no. About no, 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 yeah. So exactly. it's a very specific problem. Okay, well, that, that's clear to me. Okay, and if I may uh, ask a second question, 
when you take this g to be an exponential, I mean, this is one yeah. particular form, right? Exactly, yeah. Sure. And how dependent are your predictions on, on this choice? Yeah, so um, I, for all this social data set I had here, I only use the exponential one. Uh, because mostly because of relevant literature that I, I have seen and I have seen this, you know, this exponential uh, kernel working very well. Uh, I mean, you could do simple things like, I don't know if you're thinking about linear or something, but the problem of having the function G completely unknown, like non-parametric and learning the function, I think that's a very difficult problem. If you're talking about that, like keeping G as a function, no, I mean, and you want to actually function, right? I can pick a Gaussian. I can pick any function that decreases with time. Uh, uh, it doesn't yeah. have to be exponential. So I don't know how sensitive the model is uh, to this particular choice. Yeah. I mean, to the to the context of this social data set that we had, we, we found this to be uh, much better than a few other choices, but. Uh, I guess it wasn't the, yeah, it wasn't the main point, uh, you know, of, of me to uh, to work on the sensitivity of that. Okay, thank you very uh, much. Thank okay. you. I think I think we have one more question from someone called Mitzi. So Mitzi, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, yes, hello, thank you. Um, this was just a fabulous talk and I really, Thanks. really appreciate the um, emphasis on bridging uh, the gap that really shouldn't, I don't even know if the gap exists between statistics and computation, um, but we do need to make sure that um, uh, computational statistics advances. So I was wondering if you could tell me more about um, the tools you were using uh, to do, to, to set up these, um, these processes, your equations. Were you using a, a probabilistic oh. programming language? So I would say that that would be a very good idea. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you're, if you're talking about Stan, for instance. Um, like yeah, language. I'm a member of the STAN development team, so yes, and we want to make STAN way more scalable, okay. um, and that means working on uh, faster algorithms and better, mm -hmm. uh, faster approximation and the whole notion of, of Bayesian workflow, so yeah. Stan is sort of the answer uh, yes. I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, to be honest, I haven't used Stan for this work, but Stan is something I, I've started using in my current position now at Imperial, um, because I, I I totally agree with you. It's it's very I think it's very cool to have a programming language that in which you can write as if you're writing the mathematical model. Uh, for, so for this work, I followed, you know, my, my supervisors, <laughs> that's the truth, which used um, Python and MATLAB. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, if I would do things again, I would definitely use Stan for this, for this, because then, you know, I don't have to, I would code up from scratch every single, um, like, MCMC algorithm I had and everything, but it would, Stan would give me those. So uh, that's something I'm, I, I've started doing right now. Right now. <laughs> Great. Great, thank you. Um, and so, I, much. Yeah. so um, I think we have to move to the next speaker. Several things. Thank you very okay. much, Xenia. So uh, for those no, of thanks. you who have questions, please hold them to the end of the of the meetup. So we'll have general discussion or write them in the chat. We'll uh, we will take them later. And okay. also noted that Xenia had. Um, references in her slides and obviously after the talk I will publish the slides and so you will be able to to look at them in more detail yeah absolutely and also feel free to also contact me like uh, right, directly right. for so, these obviously. questions so um, I think as I think yeah. there's a lot of questions but please uh, hold on we have to move uh, otherwise we'll yeah we'll, okay. it's a fascinating sure. topic thank you very and much. such a great presentation <laughs> and and now we much. are going to our second speaker so Tiria Bapadzani, so Tiria, can you unmute you? So un unmute yourself and- um, Yes, hello everyone. And the floor is yours. Thank you. It's my turn to share the screen. I hope it's yes. going to work. Sure, I'm sure. 
Is it okay for everyone? Excellent. Perfect. So to start, I would first of all like to thank uh, the Paris team for asking me to speak today. It is an honor for me to participate. So my name is Satya Bambadzani. I'm an NLP data engineer at Quam Content Intelligence in Paris, France. And the topic of my presentation today is going to be about named entity recognition from a business point of view coupling a rule-based approach with machine learning algorithms. Moving on, I'm gonna start by presenting, first of all, quantum content intelligence, and then I will pass over rapidly from named entity recognition, the rule-based approach, the hybrid approach, and then I will move on to giving a use case example from some client data. And then I will present what we have done further to explore this uh, topic. So to start, Quantum Content Intelligence was founded in 2007 in Paris in France. It is a solutions editor who provides innovative software solutions in order to extract key information from textual data using semantic technologies, semantic and AI technologies. We have three main solutions, which is the QS Infomedia suit, a search engine used to manage textual and press content. Then we have Aston Reed, which is a SaaS solution for real-time web monitoring. And then we have Quantext Analytics, an analytics platform for extracting key information from textual data. So moving on to named entity recognition, we know that the first studies on information extraction were uh, in 1987. And a couple of years later, we had the first study on named entity recognition. It wasn't until 1995, during the sixth MUC conference, that named entity recognition became one of the basic NLP tasks. So how we do named entity recognition, it is divided into two basic parts. We have the entity identification part and then the entity classification part. How we move on to this, we have the rule-based approach, which, which is based on annotation rules. The learning approach, which is based on uh, word embeddings, such as word to, sorry, word to vec, statistic models, such as hidden Markov models, conditional random fields, and also neural networks. We also have the hybrid approach, which is a combination of annotation rules and a machine learning algorithm. So starting from the rule-based approach, it is for the last 10 to 15 years, it is mostly abandoned by this scientific community, but it's, it still has lots of advantages. It is robust, the results are accurate, and it is easily adaptable to new types of entities. Still, there are some drawbacks to this approach. It is based on non-contextual grammars and lexicon lists or gazetteers and it's very hard and difficult to maintain and update them in terms of time, but also human resources. It is also impossible to treat or spelling variants and the resulting ambiguity. And what is also important, at least and mostly important in the business world, is being able to discover new types of entities on the fly. For example, if there is a new startup that just emerged on the market and we're only using annotation rules and gazetteers, it'll be almost impossible to correctly identify and classify this new startup as a company. So in order to overcome this, what we've done is we use the hybrid approach. First of all, we created a data set containing over 40 million freely accessible news articles on the web using uh, one of our solutions, Ask and Read. And then we have annotated this data set using annotation rules developed by our text analytics team. This annotated data set is then used in order to train different types of machine learning models. We have a neural network with a long short-term memory layer, a word embedding such as word to vec and recently we've moved on to BERT. However, we're conscious of the fact that data pre-processing and filtering are not enough for us to say that 100% we have a clean data set. 
Furthermore, the training, state, uh, the training set also contains errors or missing annotations. To give an example, here in red, this is an article uh, in French uh, published a couple of days earlier on folding screens from Samsung. Here in red, you can see that we have Samsung Display, which is a subsidiary of Samsung. Uh, the company that is uh, identified is only Samsung, meaning that Samsung Display does not exist in our gadgets. Next, we have two types of products, Galaxy Z Fold 2 and Galaxy Z Flip. In the first case, a Z Fold 2 is not all of it uh, is partially identified, whereas Galaxy Z Flip is not identified at all. The same goes for the news platform, the ELEC in South Korea. So during the evaluation step, what we do is we improve our gazetteers by adding all the correctly identified and classified entities. Then what we do next, uh, we do a statistical evaluation in order to identify where the problems lie, which annotation rule needs further improvement. Afterwards, what we do is we re-annotate the whole data set and restart the whole process. But this is what we do for our standard application. What do we do with client data? Concretely, when we have client data, we need to extract key information that is not limited to the printified categories that are person names, locations, or organizations. Also, the size, the sometimes sensitive nature of the data set, as well as the time allocated to the project, do not always allow for machine learning. So what we propose is that, first of all, we pre-process and annotate the data using the standard application. Afterwards, we, we use a discovery annotation rule, if you will, in order to identify potentially interesting data, interesting entities in the data that do not exist in our gazetteer lists. Afterwards, we use these annotations in order to build a dedicated ontology. We were inspired by Prodigy and we decided to develop our own tool in order to allow our, uh, give our, the, our clients the possibility to build, to easily build an ontology dedicated to their project. So this is an ontology that we have on military equipment. On the left side, you have all the branches of the ontology. At uh, the middle window, you can see the content of each branch. And on the right side, you have all the uh, keywords, either uh, be it named entities or concepts that exist either in our gazetteers or are proposed by our discovery rule. So at this step, if we take an example and move further and we choose, for example, destroyers, want to see the types of destroyers, we will see that there are nine already categorized. At this step, we decided that it would be a good idea to add machine learning to the mix in order to better improve the ontology. To do so, we choose a specific destroyer in this case, and we ask to see the suggestions. These suggestions are given by a machine learning model. So it is given, it gives us uh, around 10 at this case, but I just showed the first three. Uh, the second one is Wang Jian. So in order to verify if it really is a destroyer, we go and ask for to see the context that are saved in the uh, elastic search behind in order to verify if our if this keyword, if this suggestion is really a destroyer and if, sh if should be added or not in this category. Unlike Wang Jian, we have also Busan, but Busan in the same context, we realize that is a location. So it will not be added to the destroyer category. So what we do is when we've moved, once we've moved on from named entity recognition and concept recognition, 
The next step is to establish a link between these types of entities. How we do this, we have, it's the same type of process. Uh, in the first example, we have two companies, Adas, which decided, to, uh, which finalize, finalizes the buying of a Canadian society in Infinim. In this case, the relationship between the two companies is that of the one by the other. In the second example, we have Tessie, which signs a strategic partnership with NEHS Digital. Obviously, it's not the same relationship. It's another type of relationship, that of partnership. So the same methods are implemented in order to establish these types of relations. We have a standard gazetteer with all of these expressions categorized in different types of relationships. And we use them in order to do an initial annota annotation. We move on by using another discovery annotation rule to discover new types of expressions between different types of entities. And at this stage, we use a machine learning model in order to do further exploration and improve our uh, ontologies and gadget tiers. How we do this, an example of this would be, for example, in the case of a merging of two companies. There are already different expressions between these two uh, companies that are already categorized, but we want to add more. In order to do this, we ask for the suggestions on this time on the whole category. This is due to the fact there is another, a different machine learning algorithm behind this. It's not the same. So in this case, the algorithm takes into account all of the uh, expressions already categorized in order to propose new ones. Most of them are correct, except perhaps this, the third one, which uh, for those who speak French is a verb and it's could. In this case, it is not correct. So in order to conclude my talk, First of all, we know that at least in a business setting, a rule-based approach is not sufficient for us to be able to discover new types of entities on the fly. Furthermore, when we have a client and a project, the size of the data set sometimes is not enough, nor is the time that we, are, we have until the end of the project notwithstanding the sensitive nature of, of a data client set. So what we do is we use a hybrid approach, which seems to be the most efficient since it allows us to adapt easily to different clients' data. We know that when we do an NLP task, such as named entity recognition, there are most of the time errors accumulated at every step of the way, be it normalization, data pre-processing, entity identification or other, even post-tagging most of the time. So we know what we propose, the biggest advantage of the method we propose is the fact that at every single step of the way, there is an NLP engineer that is there to evaluate, improve, constantly improve either the annotation rules, the evaluation of the model, training from the start in order to be able to propose to our clients the best possible keen sites for their own data. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Sujeria, for this um, real insight into um, the problems an industrial NLP engineer is, is, is solving. I mean, NLP is, is an area of interest for many of our participants. So it's, it's always uh, fascinating to hear about. So I'm opening the, the floor to, to questions. So if you have questions, then please um, unmute yourself and, um, and ra raise your hand. So we have a questions from um, Marie. Marie. Uh, yes. So I, I do have a question about uh, the first part of uh, your work you presented. 
which is, uh, could you describe how do you build uh, your data set? Maybe you're speaking about mistake there might be. So uh, maybe when you're spotting errors from your model, do you go to look at it? So you, you see if there is a mistake in the annotation or if it's a real mistake from your, from your model? Uh, concretely, there are two steps. First of all, when we collect the data, we do fil we filter it first because there are all types of uh, news articles on the web, and we don't take all of them into account when we build the model. So the first thing we do is pre-process the data and normalize the data. It most of the time we choose not to translate. For example, in this cases, I showed a French uh, the French models. So mostly all the articles were written in French and nothing was translated from English in order to avoid problems during translation. So to move on, uh, afterwards when we realize that there is a problem that the model proposed something that shouldn't be there, the first step is to see what we actually, what it actually learns. So if, there's, if it proposes that something is a company the first step is to actually go see what types of companies did I give in the training set? Did I actually really give only uh, companies or were there some mistakes already in the gazetteer? And then the next step would be to go and see what our annotation rules uh, identify on their own, what types of errors are not potentially taken into account. So there are different types of verification steps. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. There are several questions in chat, all related to the use of Protege. And someone is asking, have you considered using Protege? If not, why not? And someone is asking uh, why you needed a different tool than Protege, in which way is VETA tool? And uh, so if you can um, answer those. Of course. Uh... I've used the protege in a scientific background. So saying that it is very complex, we can do many complex things, but we chose to develop our own um, tool because we, could, we would be able to modify everything depending on our client's needs. First of all, what we did was we were inspired by it. We decided that creating categories, being able to easily categorize multiple keywords, uh, change their position and everything we can do with Protege is really great. So we're gonna keep that. But then we also wanted to be able to add things to it. For example, we have different types of features such as you can directly add a list uh, gazetteer that is on your computer directly to our tool. So if you have your own uh, personal ontology as a client it's, that is not available everywhere, you can actually integrate it to your project and move on from there. The same goes for Wikidata. Some clients want to import directly uh, categories from Wikidata and improve them for their own use. So we chose to develop our own tool and enabled uh, to propose this. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. So do we have, uh, do we have more questions for Soteria? If not, then uh, perhaps we can spend the last uh, couple of minutes of, of this meeting. If anyone has questions to anyone, you can have questions to Paris team, you can have questions to uh, Limassol team, you can have questions to Xenia, you can have questions to so so uh, so, Tiria, please uh, raise your hand and, and manifest yourself before we all go. Uh, normally, when we have online in person meetups, we have uh, some drinks, but obviously now we can have drinks in, in the privacy of our own homes. So, um, please, uh, if anyone has any questions, raise your hand. And I'll try to see. Are there any hands raised? There's some messages. Everyone says thank you. Please um, 
Silverus has a question to Xenia. Please, Silverus, unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you for uh, amazing presentations. Um, and uh, I remember that in the slide, uh, Xenia uh, shows that uh, this method is amazing for scalability. Uh, I just, uh, I'm interested, uh, did you test it with some large data sets? And uh, if yes, what was the volume of the data? Let's say uh, size of the graph. And uh, I'm just interested about the experiment process. Xenia, unmute yourself, please. Can you unmute yourself? Otherwise, we'll try to unmute. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hello, yeah. So, yeah, th thanks a lot for the question. Um, so, it was um, just a few things to just, you know, clarify here. Firstly, it was compared to other, you know, methods that work and use point processes and, you know, compared to other methods in, in probabilistic modeling, uh, it, it performs uh, well. And what do I mean well? I like the data set I, I was you know, applying them on had, uh, I mean, not millions, but like um, tens of thousands of people. This is the scale I am working on. Uh, but of course the number of messages, right? Being exchanged are of their own. Yeah, that's, you know, millions and, and billions. Um, of course, uh, if you use, you know, a, let's say a deep learning method on this, you can, you can have much better performance. I don't know if, if, if this is also related to your question, uh, but within the umbrella of this uh, Bayesian non-parametric methods that I'm working with, I just you know try to optimize it as much as possible in order to make it comparable, let's say, to some sort of deep learning method. Uh, but the numbers are, are those in my case, I think it was kind of like 50,000 people in one of them and something around that for the others. But the number of messages, of course, is much, much more. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, sure. And uh, and did you use any graph databases to, uh, to store the data or you just tested uh, with your own tools? Yes. So you know, this is some work I've done during my PhD. And I guess part of the whole, you know, learning process in the PhD was to write everything from scratch. So this, the, the, the algorithm that basically just um, accepts a, a matrix, right? Because a matrix can represent the graph. So position IJ is whether I is connected to J. So um, the input will be these kinds of data. And I will, you know, just code up an MCMC uh, algorithm with, with different uh, variations and tweaks that to make this fast. I mean, if you're familiar with MCMC, I um, mean, the, the, the step that made my work much faster was a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo step. Yeah. If this is of any, yeah, use. Um, but I, I think that if you just, I don't know, if trivially using these methods, we want to work on graphs, it can be very bad. Isn't it? I mean, it needed a lot of effort to, to make this uh, comparable. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank okay. you very much. So thank you very much, Ksenia. So do we have any more questions? If not, then um, I will just remind you that we are going to- There's a to question in the chat. We have a question in the chat. All right. Um, from Arya Karami. My question is about how we can consider latent communities. What are candidate methods and what would be its effect on the model efficiency and complexity? So Ksenia, it's another question for you. Yes. Um, so the way I encode uh, in this model latent communities is within the the, the link probability, right? It does, has nothing to do with the excitation part, with the function and the exponential kernel and everything, but it has to do with the link probability, the mu ij. And I mean, I can tell you exactly how, how I do that here is that for every person in the network, I have a vector, okay? My parameter is a vector and the, the um, you know, each entry is the level of affiliation of that person to that community. 
Okay, and then the link probability I take is the dot product. So this is this is capturing, um, uh, it's called assortativity or homophily in the sense that if we both have similar affiliations, right? If our vectors are high on the similar entries, then the link probability is higher. So that, that's exactly how I capture latent, uh, you know, latent communities. And things that relate to my research are, are like stochastic block models, if you're familiar with these, um, or other, um, I think, yeah, mixed membership model is something else that's very relevant. Um, in my case, it's, for every person is a vector, the dot product gives the link probability. And again, that is, uh, that is the simplest case because you can change that and tune it or some things like that. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm taking one last question from Panayota Katsamba, please. Unmute yourself, Panayota, and go ahead. Hi, all. Uh, thank you for uh, this lovely meeting uh, and uh, both speakers. Um, so firstly, I'd like to ask uh, Xenia, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, as an, I appreciate the maths uh, as an applied mathematician myself. Uh, I was wondering whether, um, if you, I remember in, you had these formulas with mu ij and eta ij. Uh, yes, so I, I had mu ij exactly, the, the link probability uh, mm -hmm. between i and j. For eta, actually, I didn't have ij, but it's something that you could have. So, uh, so I was wondering um, whether, so you said new IJ is whether two people are connected. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, or exactly. Originally, it's like, is a probability that we're connected so that we can then start sending messages in that particular example. Okay, so it, it, it I presume it takes the value zero and one? Um, it's, uh, yes, uh, in that case it is, or it is proportional to that. So, um, yeah, actually, you're raising a very good point there. If that new IJ is not the, uh, it's not the binary probability, but it's proportional to that. So what I exactly take is one minus e to the minus exponential of new IJ, if that makes sense. So in order to make it binary. Okay. Um, so where, how, how would you um, uh, model, uh, say, an influencer in, in say? Uh, Twitter would would that go in new IJ or would you model um, because I guess if you have an influencer yeah. uh, then mm -hmm. they have like a higher intensity of uh, of promoting um, I guess influencing whoever's uh, responding to their messages H how would you model an influencer um, would it, yeah yeah I think that's another very good point in my model I wouldn't I wouldn't add this in the in the exponential part, in the kernel part, the eta and deltas. I would model it in this original new IJ thing because in this setup under these assumptions, an influencer for me is somebody who has a lot of connections. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to define it as somebody who sends a lot of messages. I'll define it as somebody who has a lot of connections. So the the link probability of this person to a lot of others is high. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is this is very relevant to, like, if I forget the whole uh, like citation part and I only focus on the link probability, like the the way I parameterize it and I choose the priors on those is so that you can have heterogeneity in the degree. You can have people with a huge number of connections and people with very few. So um, the whole point is to allow for this, and when coded in the new IJ. Right, in, in, yeah, that was, yeah, in that the was original thing. Yes, well, yeah. that, that's a great guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and also, um, if, if I can, uh, yeah, direct a few uh, questions to the Limassol chapter uh, organizers. Um, I mean, as a community, is there is there a place uh, where uh, people can post or communicate with each other or... Uh, post training opportunities, etc. Christina or Georgina, unmute yourself. Yes, yes, sorry, I was waiting to see if Georgina would answer, yes. <laughs> so, 
Um, so Banayota, we obviously have the meetup group and we have also uh, pages on uh, social media. We have a Facebook group and a LinkedIn group. So uh, this is the way to communicate with each other. But definitely, if you have any specific ideas and recommendations, uh, please re reach out to, to us directly, either through the Women in Machine Learning Limassol uh, pages or directly with me and uh, Georgina. Uh, because we definitely... Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Christina, to interrupt you. There is also the, the Slack uh, channel, and uh, all chapters are active there, and you can uh, connect and come in contact with us and the other uh, chapter worldwide. You can find all the information on the web page, and um, possibly also there is a lot of information on the meetup page. Right, and so and for this meetup, um, we are going obviously to publish all the slides and also uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with, with, with the chapters, also with the speakers. And I think um, sort of the event unfortunately has to terminate now. I would like to thank very much our speakers, Ksenia and Tiria. We learned quite a lot this evening. Thank you very much for playing the game and being such great speakers. And obviously, so much a huge thanks to the uh, to Christina and Georgina, who, who just our pleasure to to work together. And it was our first opportunity to do something together. But I really hope we stay in touch and uh, advance in and do more things. Yes, so likewise. Thank here. you very much. See you in Cyprus for the next one. Right. So we're looking yes. forward. Really well. Looking Data forward. science and beach. This is the next uh, meetup. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. Thank everyone for being here. Thank you. And, uh, get in touch Thank with you. you also. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.